you, you all know how DNA is a double helix with uh, uh, nucleotide rungs and the ladder. Well, certain molecules, especially certain drug molecules, can slide right in between the rungs of that ladder. And without imparting any physical deformation to the molecule, they can change its properties. In fact, this may be how psychedelic drugs work. Now, we're at the edge of known physiology and neurophysiology when we talk like this. One of the great puzzles of uh, biology or human biology is the persistence of memory. In other words, uh, it's said that every molecule in your body is uh, cycled within a five-year period that, you know, six years ago there wasn't a single atom in your body that is now in your body. The form persists, but the matter is traded in and out, except in one case, which is the neurons do not trade out. The neurons that you're born with are the neurons that you die with. So then the problem here is memory. Uh, you, you can be 70 years old and have an absolutely crystal clear memory of your first day of attending school in that red brick schoolhouse 65 years ago. Okay, conservatively, seven times every molecule in your body has been swapped out so where has this memory been all this time that you can pull it up with perfect clarity? This is a great mystery of metabolism, unsolved to this day. There are several possibilities. One possibility is that memories are not located in the body at all. Although suggesting this is no magic bullet, it raises a number of questions, probably as difficult to solve as the original question for which this was proposed as a solution. Okay, what are the other possibilities? The memories must be stored then in the non-degrading part of the body. The non-degrading part of the body is the neural DNA. <clears throat> the cell nuclei of neurons don't change within your lifetime. Well, so then you, t you take this idea to an or uh, orthodox uh, uh, molecular biologist or neurophysiologist or geneticist, and they say, well, this is just bunk. I mean, in the first place, you don't understand the concept information. The kind of information which is stored in DNA is sequences of nucleotides which code for protein. To confuse that with an image of your great grandmother's face is to just, you know, have such a, a mush of categories that it's hopeless to even talk to you. Okay, so that destroyed the supposition, but it didn't solve the problem of memory, yeah. What about the possibility that what happens when you remember that schoolhouse 65 years ago, that you aren't remembering it, you are remembering the last time you remembered it, that you only actually remembered that schoolhouse once, and then every time after that, all you remember is the last time you remembered it. But what if you haven't remembered it for 50 years? I mean, this happens. But, but I'm suggesting that you're not remembering it each time. You're only, you're only remembering a snapshot of it. You remember the last time you remembered it. But what if that was more than that length of time ago? Yeah, that doesn't solve this problem of happen. how is the memory trace able to persist. Well, so uh, Dennis's notion was he said that some form of superconductivity 
must be involved. Now, this was 1971. Superconductivity was not known to occur more than three-tenths of a degree above zero absolute. He said, no, there must be room temperature superconductivity going on in the DNA. This must be how the DNA preserves information. Now, if you know anything about superconductivity, it is the perfect uh, 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 physical phenomenon to use for preserving information because no information degrades in a superconducting circuit. Say you have a ring of supercooled gold and you impart an electric current to this ring. That current, barring interruption of the superconducting state, will circle that gold ring with zero resistance for eternity. Now, the only thing which can cause the superconducting phenomenon to cease is if a high energy source overwhelms the superconductivity, comes in from the outside and disrupts it. Now, think about the, the problem that nature faces with the genetic machinery. The key to life is error-free copying. Wherever there's error, then there becomes mutation or problem or incompatibility. So all of the strategies of genetic preservation of information seek to maximize the absence of error. So the perfect mechanism for doing this would be a superconducting mechanism. Now you see the major cause of mutation in the natural environment is cosmic radiation, ambient cosmic rays, high energy particles that smash into the genome, physically collide with the DNA and break the bonds and disrupt the, uh, the message so that it can't be copied. Superconductivity would be the natural uh, medium to retard this process. So Dennis's notion was that the DNA was a kind of superconducting uh, storage device and that in fact what we call the Jungian unconscious or the racial memory or the genetic memory could be tapped into and that what a, what a drug trip is, is a neurotransmitter that competes with serotonin that then broadcasts off this genetic memory bank a slightly different slice of the catalog. Serotonin broadcasts are the equivalent of traffic and weather reports where it tells you how to get around in the world and where not to go and how to avoid problems. If you swap out the serotonin channel for the psilocybin channel, suddenly it's the equivalent of Pacifica radio. It's running philosophy discussions and classical music from another planet, you see, because the, the efficiency and the emphasis of these neurotransmitters is different. Well...